So for 2,000 years, these are the planets that drove all of this work, including New Horizon, everything. Uh, my work, explain this to me, Lucy. This is, how do you make Jupiter? Until, until 1992. Now, the one thing that you might have picked up on my talk so far, I hope, is what we see depends on the technology that we have. So the ancients didn't have technology except for their eyes and their brain, which is pretty good. Um, they also had, uh, they built some way to measure, to keep track of what they are seeing. And it wasn't until Galileo picked up technology, a telescope. And this telescope, believe me, they, they, they had one of these telescopes as a, um, as a kind of like a, a souvenir of 400 years of Galileo's birthday, I think it was a few years ago. So you could buy it for 10 or $15. That he did anything with that telescope, that man is a genius. I don't know how he could do it. My kids used to go to Burger King. Well, we went, went to Burger King and there was a part where they got, there was the Explorer series and they got these binoculars. Those binoculars were better than what that telescope was. Uh, it's amazing what you want, what you can do. So it's the technology that really makes a difference. At this time, um, the telescope industry was developing something very interesting, adaptive optics. And what adaptive optics is, is attachment to engineered equipment attached to telescopes to kind of um, um, take into account and nullify the atmosphere. So if ever you see a picture of a telescope and there's usually a laser beam coming out of it, what that laser beam is, is recording what the atmosphere is doing and then feeding that information back into the telescope, into the computer. And it's an interesting thing because what the computer will do is when light comes in through our atmosphere, there's a lot of molecules and atoms there, and light scatters. So what happens is as the light comes in through the atmosphere, it's scattering, and so you kind of get fuzzy. What the telescope will do, what this adaptive optics will do is kind of straighten it out. If it knows that the atmosphere is going to scatter it this way, it compensates and computes that the photon should be going in another. So it kind of straightens it out. And it finally got to a point where this adaptive optics was really coming in its to its own in, in about 1990s. The very first, now it's called the companion. They weren't called planets yet. They were called companions to the to this object that they were looking at. And Voschan and Frail were looking at a pulsar and they noticed something and they finally determined that there were companions, which turned out to be planets, going around the pulsar. Now a pulsar is a really strange object. The pulsar is a very late evolved star. And it's a very large star. I mean, for, for instance, this one is one and a half times the mass of the Earth, uh, of the Sun. And what it does is it's collapsed. And it is less than the radius of the Earth. It's about a city size big. So you can imagine scrunching all that material. It's made out of neutrons, basically. What kind of material it is, I'm going to give it to the quantum mechanics people to kind of visualize it. All I know is I don't want to live on that planet because the space is kind of um, distorted. The magnetic field is kind of interesting. I don't want to live in a magnetic field. Um, but there are planets there. Where did they come from? How did they form? Um, that's someone else's PhD thesis. Uh, then in 1995, we hit jackpot. Um, two groups, uh, Mayor and Kelos in Europe, in Switzerland, and Marcy and Butler here in California, uh, at Lick, actually, um, uh, reported that they found a planet around a sun-like star. Now, it's not surprising that they should find a big planet close up to the sun. Because what they were doing is watching that dog pull on the owner. And what you have to do is when you have something like this, um, you only have a lifetime and not that long. And you don't have a grant money 
for that long. So what you're going to do is look for something where you can see the wobble and that something that you could see the periodicity of it going around fast. And so what they found was a Jupiter-sized uh, planet, half of Jupiter's mass, and it went around, uh, it orbited around the sun in about four days. So um, it was extraordinary when they reported it. The story about this is also quite extraordinary because Marcy and Butler had been doing this for 14 years on pennies. Whenever, and this, they were working on this project right uh, during when Silicon Valley was flowering. So uh, Silicon Graphics was still around. And every time they heard that any of these companies were updating their computers, they went knocking around saying, you know, can we have your old computers? Because this is very intensive. And if you're on a grant, if you're an academic, if you're an astronomer, if you're an observer looking for planets in the 1990s, you're not going to get money. Uh, now it's fashionable, but not then. So, um, so under incredible conditions, they, they really did an amazing job of finding it. And since then, we have found a lot of planets. Now, Gene Schneider um, uh, started this web page, exoplanet.eu, right from the beginning. And if ever you want to have you know, lunch and planets, Go to his website and play. He's got uh, things that you can pick out planets and read about them, or you could pick out characteristics and plot things up. It's a really, really fun kind of a, uh, and it, it's, and he keeps up, he, it, it's still maintained on a, probably on a weekly, if not daily basis. And then there's Kepler, and Kepler is the one, the mother load of planets. Once the telescope went and looked now, um, Kepler, what the telescope does is it doesn't look at the whole sky. What it does is looks at one constellation. It's in Cygnus. And it's got particular stars, a catalog of stars that it is constantly watching. Well, it's not watching it anymore. It, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, had a difficulty. But what it did is it's got still, it confirmed about a 1,000 um, planets and it's got another 4,000 candidates. There is another phase of they're still able to monitor some. So what Kepler does is actually watch the light being decreased as the planet goes across it. Now, uh, anybody, uh, two years ago, three years ago, anybody notice the sun dimming when Venus transited the sun? <laughs> no, um, you had to have a telescope to see it, and even that, you know, you didn't have to, you know, it, it, the light. Kepler, the accuracy of what Kepler can see, the analogy is if we put a telescope here and pointed it to a lamp post on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, it would be able to detect the decrease of the light from that lamp when a fly went past it. The, um, uh, Natalie Battaglia, who is one of the chief scientists there, she told the story about how um, uh, there's a group in uh, Denmark who studies pulsating stars, and they also watch the change in light of, uh, uh, that the star gives out. And uh, so one of the things that Kepler has to do is figure out whether the decrease in the sunlight is due to a planet, or is it pulsating, or is it a binary star system, and one is blocking the other. So that's, that's part of the fun of the research. And so this group of our Larry Star researchers asked for her raw data for, for some of and. Um, Usually, astronomers, when they get their data, they have to process it, clean it up, make it nice, nice. But Kepler had done such a great job of, and, and the accuracy of the data is so incredible. So she just sent it off. The next day, she gets an email, and the, um, the, the email was from the director saying, but we asked for the raw data, not the process data. And she sent back, you got the raw data. And the satisfaction that she got, and it's just like that, you know, you could tell that electronic silence on the other end when he opened up that. So Kepler is, an ext again, your tax dollars at work. One-tenth of a penny, folks. One-tenth of a penny. And it took Bill Baruchi seven years to convince NASA 
to fund it. So again, the collaborative work. So I'd like to take this opportunity to describe some of the other planets that we have here. Um, whoops, I should speed up here. Um, well, 51 Peg was the very first planet that Marcy and Butler and Kilos and Mayor found, um, reported on. Rocky planet, this is the very, very first rocky planet found, and it's very close to its star. Um, this is Kepler, Kepler 11, and this is the first planetary system. It has six planets. Um, Tatooine, Tatooine was great. Um, this is the, uh, now we had somebody in our research group, a graduate student, and she modeled that planets could form around a binary system. But up until then, you know, no, nah, you can't. Usually you have planetary systems forming around a single star. That's like us. It's always just like us. And, um, uh, so, uh, and the b binary stars would be too disruptive to planets. Wouldn't they be able to form? And here's Tatooine, and they found it. They actually found a planet that orbits around two stars. Very centric orbit, and it doesn't weave in and out. It orbits both stars. So it's really quite extraordinary. There's our first water planet, habitable zone. It's two and a half times more massive than Earth, so I don't think I'd like to live on it. A lot of gravitational pull on you. And then there's Formula. There are more stars that, are peop uh, that people are looking for to find uh, direct imaging of stars. So we have them. We definitely can see them. And the big question is, where do they come from? Well, they come from this, they come from this, they come from this, they come from this. These are all nebula. They're all tens of light years across. They're all very massive. And it's not like the whole thing makes one star. In fact, um, this is the Eagle Nebula. And you might recognize this, this part. Well, it's on the next slide. What I'm going to do is try to show you what a solar system would look like in a big nebula like this. So you can imagine how many solar systems are formed from this. So we've got the Eagle Nebula, and we're going to pull in on the pillars of creation, Hubble's, Hubble's masterpiece. And then we're going to enlarge on that left pillar, right there on the tip. And then we're going to even focus on the tip of the tip. And we got it down to pixelation, and that would be the size of our solar system. So you can imagine how much mass there is in those clouds, those nebula. So how does this all work? Um, again, I haven't been doing a lot of the mathematical end of it. Can we understand this? Now, Dr. Uh, Matthew Bate, he's at University of Exeter in England. He's been doing these gaseous collapses of stars and stuff for a very long time. Uh, it's, impo you know, it's very difficult. I can't download his videos, but what I did was kind of take snapshots of his work and kind of give you an impression. And what that is, is, well, you, first of all, you can clearly see that it does have that nebulous look. What those yellow objects are, are stars that are formed. So you can see how easy it is to form a star. And it doesn't take long, 200,000 years. So you start off with a big, nice spherical cloud of about 500 solar masses, and you make stars. And they cluster up. And then there's, you can see some objects there. They're, they're kind of on the edges. And what happens gravitationally, some of these objects get thrown out. And those are the single stars. And that's what's believed that, you know, that's how our star was formed. We were thrown out of a group. So what happens is, and this is a theme of variation. You get something big, it fragments, it collapses, and first you have a big cloud doing it, and it's going to fragment into what we call molecular clouds, and they get smaller and smaller, and inside the molecular clouds, they start gravitationally attracting, and the whole idea is that this big cloud eventually collapses into something that looks like a solar system. Um, this process. So it starts out, and again, it's rotating. First it's slowly, and then it kind of collapses downwards. And inside, what you're doing is it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's gravitationally 
gravitating and getting bigger and bigger and hotter and hotter, and you start forming a star. Do we know it's true? Yep. These are protoplanetary disks. What this is, is a picture of observations of this center object. So we know this, it, it, it's out there. Now, I just want to point this out. What we have here is, we're always talking about that this being the solar system. Yeah, we got that in here. But what about all this other material out there? So you've got the protostar, and then you've got this protoplanetary disk there. So you have all of that. So this is what we're comfortable with right there. But there's still all of this. Well, it turns out that we've been discovering that there is a whole lot more outside of the solar system, our old-fashioned solar system. Right now, what we have is right outside is the Kuiper belt, and that's where Pluto goes in and out, and Eris. And this is where New Horizon is going to continue going into the Kuiper belt and explore more and more of what's, what's in there. And that's going to be really exciting, that really, to see what's out there. But what we learned from comets is that there is a spherical shell around us. There are two kinds of comets. There are comets that go around oh, about 100 years, and they're periodic. But then there are some comets that come from anywhere around. And we kind of figured, well, there's got to be some material out there that we can't see. And that's called the Oort cloud. This is our solar system. So. How do we go from something like this into a planet? And it basically is the same principle of what uh, a skater does. You get something really, really, you know, she's skating around, making a nice little pirouette, and as she's bringing her, bringing her arms in, she's getting uh, faster and faster and faster. And that's, and hotter and hotter, and that's what happened with our, um, uh, the gas that made our solar system. You know, notice if she has a, p a ponytail, then her ponytail sticks out, kind of flattens things out. Big question is, how come we're not rotating out of, out of control? Well, it turns out that there's stuff in there. Not only is there gas, but there's solid material, and that solid material is banging into each other. And as it's banging into each other, it kind of slows things down, and it flattens things even more. Anybody who's gone to Stanford Shopping Mall at Christmas Eve, ever notice you run into, the, into Macy's and you're doing fine and then once you start bumping into people, you slow down and if you're not careful, you'll get flattened out? <laughs> Same principle. Same principle. So, simple. What happens is the gas goes to the sun, some gas goes away, the solid material goes around and we make planets. So the nebula is where we come from, and it looks easy. And in some ways there is. 